Hello, we are In Conversation, a podcast from the School of Social and Family Dynamics at Arizona State University, designed to showcase timely and informative insights from leading faculty, researchers, and other experts which impact the ever-changing social world in which we live in. Here at the School of Social and Family Dynamics, we recognize that the land which we are hosting this conversation at Arizona State University belongs to the Maricopa and Pima peoples, and we are so privileged to welcome you to today's conversation. Hi, everyone. On today's episode of In Conversation with the School of Social and Family Dynamics, there is a mature content warning, so viewers should be advised. Welcome, welcome everyone. My name is Aubrey Hoffer and I'm your graduate student host of In Conversation with the School of Social and Family Dynamics. My distinguished guest today is my friend and soon to be doctor, Diana Jenkins. You may remember Diana from our GSA episode because she served as president of GSA in the 2020 to 2021 school year. Her work focuses on the intersection of gender, masculinity, and sexual objectification. Diana, I'm so excited to have this conversation with you today, so thank you for coming on. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm very excited, and I look forward to our podcast today. Great. So the podcast generally starts and ends the same way. I'm going to ask you three rapid fire questions. These introductory ones are just going to be icebreakers to get to know you better on the surface level. And then the ending ones will get some quick bites of your personal philosophy. The point is just answer them in about a sentence. How does that sound? Sounds great. Okay. So my first question, Diana, is what do you like to listen to in the car? Yeah, I mean, I love music, right? Like I have to have music on in the background, whether I'm working or I'm driving, like anything. (laughs) So I'm a big fan of music. I usually listen to female artists, um, usually in like the, you know, kind of hip hop or, you know, something in that area. So I like to listen to like Jesse Reyes, Kalani, her, those are probably my favorite artists. Um, but I'm really good with any type of music from rock to country. So whatever's on, I'm jamming out to it. I love that. My second question is what is something that makes you laugh? Oh my gosh. I love comedies. Like I'm a big fan of comedy movies, even if they're just stupid, (laughs) you know, slapstick comedy, you know, something about it just brightens your day. And I just kind of like, I love watching comedy, like TV shows and, and movies. So. What are one of your favorite comedic movies or TV shows? I mean, Friends is obviously everyone loves Friends, but okay, it's really good and it just makes you in a really good mood. I love Friends and I love New Girl. So my favorites. Oh, I love New Girl and Friends is classic for a reason, right? Yeah, exactly. My final question is, this might be deceptive because we are in Arizona, but do you prefer hot or cold weather? I probably would say hot because I mean, I don't know. I, cause I've been here for so long most of my life. And so maybe I'm just used to it and the cold is beautiful. I lived in Flagstaff for four years, so I got the cold, but you know, I guess if I had to choose, I would pick a hotter weather cause snow is a nightmare. <laughs> All right, Diana, let's get into the conversation a little bit now. So your work really focuses on these really nuanced concepts like gender, masculinity, and sexual objectification. I was hoping that you could tell me a little bit about your experiences as a woman in academia and what sort of factors have really influenced your desire to better understand these constructs. Yeah, it's it's so interesting because, you know, I've I've been interested in gender since high school and then in college like that really solidify that, okay, this is what I want to do. I want to study gender, but I never put it in the perspective of myself sometimes um, as like an undergrad, you know, and even now I'm like, people like, you know, well, you're a woman in in an academia, which is, you know, based on patriarchy and things. And I'm like, oh, you know, it's just because you're kind of in it. And, um, but, you know, you can definitely acknowledge some of those things, especially in academia, which is founded on patriarchy, white, kind of, you know, the dominant culture, and that culture trickles down to students. And so my experience in academia has, you know, I'm lucky to be in a program where it's female dominated, um, unlike other programs that are male dominated. As a woman here, I feel a little bit more of a 
security, but you know, those patriarchal ideas definitely trickle down into, you know, work-life balance and even down to how much we get paid and how much we are respected as female scholars. Um, and I think that's, that's kind of my experience with, with it is that, you know, you can study everything and you can know a lot and, you know, we're all experts in our own field, but once we step out of this, we're going to be hit hard with some of these biases. Um, and I know for men have talked to me about my research and have definitely, you know, maybe not thought that I knew what I was talking about or, you know, thought that I was just a student who, you know, whatever. So, you know, it's definitely a challenge. Women have hurdles in all sorts of career types and academia is definitely one of them also. Um, so I think I'm going off <laughs> on a tangent here, but yeah, my experience has been mostly positive, trinkled in with some, you know, negative experiences, usually with, with men and, in, in uh, you know, for the higher education space. But yeah, that's why we all have to get into it. You know, we have to get into the field and make moves. So we need more women, more women of color to make some of these changes in a historically male dominated you know, culture. Exactly. And understanding uh, these constructs in a more nuanced way and taking on a more feminist perspective is really important in understanding things like objectification, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So much of what you said has really resonated with me because, you know, there's a lot of intersection between sort of your work with sort of gender roles and a lot of my work with body image, because a lot of what influenced me was looking around at, you know, really a lot of the women in my life and realizing, oh, wow, they all hate their bodies. And I really wanted to better understand why that was the case. Do you feel like you could parallel that experience in your own life? where maybe you looked around and you saw the way that, you know, women were objectified or the ways you saw women being treated and it just made you want to better understand why that is the case? Oh, absolutely. And I think we all have our own, you know, struggles internally with these societal beauty standards. And that comes out in many different ways, but internalized sexualization or self-objectification or ways that women internalize these sexist messages and these messages that women's bodies are more important than who they are as a person. And so, you know, for me personally, I was, you know, my mom was one that kind of, you know, sent those messages to me subconsciously probably about, you know, wearing makeup and looking presentable and you know, all of these things, what to wear for your body type. And it just all seemed a little bit much for me when I was growing up, but at the time you don't have words for it. And then, you know, you grow up and you become an adult. And so in, you know, my early twenties, I really started to question these gender roles. And I said, why is it that I have to make this effort to look a certain way when my boyfriend can just roll out of bed and he's fine? You know, how come people usually talk to him instead of me, especially when it's things relating to technology, my car, or anything like that? Why is it? And so I really started to question those gender roles in my own life. And then that kind of, you know, carried over into my research life. And so then I can actually test some of these things, which is very exciting. Um, but yeah, I've, I've struggled with you know, these societal messages with my own body image, um, as many women do, um, and uh, many men do. And so it's really an issue of this, the idea of, you know, perpetuating beauty standards that, you know, media promotes. And so, um, yeah, I, I definitely have had a lot of uh, struggle, internal struggles that carry into my research is probably why I study a lot of it. Well, I think that can explain why a lot of us get into the work we're interested in, right? You have to really kind of be all in in order to want to understand these things. So one thing that you talked about was this idea of internalized sexual objectification. Um, can you explain for those who might not know, what is this internalized objectification and is that common? 
Yeah, so internalized objectification or sexualization, there's been a lot of terms usually, um, is it's really the, it's prioritizing women's bodies um, and their sexual parts over who the woman is as a person. So her intelligence or her character is not as important as her body or her sexual parts. So, um, you know, theorists have applied this to many different realms. I usually look at adolescent girls because that's kind of where this I solidifies, you know, puberty happens and girls see their bodies in a different way. Their bodies are changing. They're getting messages from society saying you need to look this way, you need to be this way, which causes depression, anxiety, eating disorders, body image issues, body surveillance, self-esteem, all of these negative outcomes because of how we're teaching little girls to look. And then that carries on, you know, developmentally into young adulthood as well. Um, and these messages can carry on as we know, generation to generation. Um, and so that's kind of the broad definition of internalized sexualization. I can go into more depth if, if you want to. No, I think that's a great sort of primer for people who might not be familiar with that idea. And I love that you mentioned this sort of idea of like multiple sources of where these ideas come from, right? Like one big one is obviously like culture, generally speaking, right? Like we see ads, we see TV shows, we see movies that really solidify this idea of this is how a woman looks, this is how a woman acts, this is how a woman is and should be in order to be desirable, right? Because that's sort of the whole thing with women, right? Is that everything we're taught is about how to be as desirable as possible and it's desirable for men right because that's sort of the that's who is in power in our society but you also brought up earlier when you were talking about getting those messages from your mom I think that that's really interesting too because it shows how pervasive objectification and sexualization really is is that you know my mom obviously did incredibly similar things to me when I was growing up and it's not something that comes from malice. In fact, I would argue that our mothers probably thought they were protecting us because they wanted us to be desirable women because that's what society wants you to be. And that's what you benefit from becoming. However, when you are able to sort of peel back the surfaces and understand the history of how those roles came about, we can really understand that that's horrible. <laughs> like that, it really is just a horrible thing for young women to be taught. Yes, absolutely. And you know, and our moms aren't, yeah, doing any thing. They don't think it's harmful and you know, they're trying to help us and raise young girls. And that's how young girls were raised, especially during their time. Um, to prioritize some of those things. The culture is shifting, um, I think a little bit. And so that's kind of why we're seeing some of these things and pointing them out. Whereas, you know, maybe our moms and our dads and our parents haven't really picked up on that because of so many years of training or socialization, right? This, these messages happen on a daily basis for years and years and years and decades and decades. And so those things are really solidified to the point where it's just second nature. And so if when I was younger, if my mom said, you know, here's some blush, put some blush on or lipstick on, it's not questioned because that's just kind of how it's been done. Um, and so, yeah, there's no, you know, malicious intent or anything. And so I don't want to target anybody, you know, but it's, it's a good time for us to question why do I have to put on this lipstick? Why do I have to put on blush? Why does my hair have to be how it is? Why do I have to wear the clothes that I wear? Um, it's, it's a good time for us to question these things and for little girls to question them too. And that's going to start shifting the culture of, you know, of sexist messages and, and sexual harassment, which is also tied to some of these um, ideals about women's bodies.
Right. I think it's so important that you bring up the why and understanding why it is that we engage in these behaviors. I mean, for those who are just listening, I I don't think Diana will object to me saying that she and I both present in a very feminine way. We both like to wear makeup and pretty dresses and do our hair. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? Like there's nothing inherently wrong with presenting in a feminine way, but it's really important to understand why am I doing this? And if I'm putting on makeup and pretty dresses for the sole reason of men, of wanting men to like me better or wanting other people to see me in a certain way, there's some damaging aspects to that as opposed to putting on lipstick and pretty dresses because you just like lipstick and pretty dresses. Yes. And another point to that is, you know, we are adult women and we maybe still have some of these messages that are socialized and that we still feel like we need to put on mascara to go out of the house. Those are things that we have to work through as adults, but we can make the decision and choose what to do. And we can question those things. Whereas adolescents and teens might not have the freedom to do that um, or might not have the words or the tools to understand some of those things. And that's really, you know, an important part. I know a lot of my research is looking at young adults and college students, but um, you know, when it comes to internalized sexualization, I think targeting adolescents and prevention and intervention research is going to be so helpful and giving girls the tools to feel confident in their bodies, to not listen to messages and ads and media, and to really shift the culture and then choose if they want to wear pretty just dresses and makeup, they can choose to do that. Right. So on the subject of internalized sexualization, I do feel like I need to give a little bit of a spoiler that Diana and I are collaborators and we actually are currently working on a project that talks about internalized sexualization among women. Diana, would it be all right if you described a little bit about that project and sort of talked about why this came about and what you were hoping to find in asking about women's internalized sexualization the way that you did in the project we're working on. Yes, and I love our paper. It's I'm so excited um, to be getting it out soon. So, you know, Aubrey and I, are, we've, we've kind of talked about, you know, this idea of internalized sexualization and how it relates to women. And also, so I kind of added in the piece where, you know, let's think about how sexual objectification fits into this. So. If I'm a woman and I have this internalized, these internalized messages of how I should be, does that relate to me objectifying other women? Meaning like women should do this. So in my head, I think, okay, I like to wear makeup. I have to wear pretty dresses. Um, I like to get the attention of men. Does that relate to, okay, women should do that too. Women should be sexual objects for men. Women should wear makeup. Women should wear tight clothes and, and so forth. So those are kind of the two things I was looking at and connecting them, right? So do women, um, you know, who internalize these messages have sexual objectification towards other women? And what we found was that is the case um, for straight women. Uh, so this study we uh, looked at bisexual women and straight women to just kind of see the layers and the nuances of sexual objectification because Aubrey and I got to thinking, okay, well, this might only be prudent for straight women because these items and what we're studying is really about men, right? Getting men's attention. If a bisexual woman or a lesbian woman, you know, they might not have the urges or like the, the, the need to get men's attention if they're not attracted to, to men, right? And so that was kind of the basis of our whole project. Um, so we did find that internalized sexualization was related to women objectifying other women. However, for bisexual women, they had much less internalized sexualization to begin with. So comparing straight and bisexual women, they are not seeing the negative effect of this internalized messages. And therefore, they're also not objectifying other women. Bisexual women are unique because they are attracted to both men and women. And so we're trying to kind of peel back the layers of this and what does that really mean for women? What does that mean 
for sexual objectification, right? So they could still, they still have like these feelings, but they're not as strong as straight women, but they're not to the extent of, you know, by lesbian women have much less, you know, so they're kind of in the middle. And, you know, previous research have, you know, looked at bisexual women and they're very unique in that they, the research shows that bisexual women get a lot of this, a lot of biases towards them about, you know, who they're attracted to. Some people think that they're, you know, phonies or they need to pick someone they're attracted to or that they're, you know, kind of attracted to everybody and just kind of being sexually provocative with everybody. And so there's a lot of stigma around bisexual individuals, especially women. And, you know, so that's really a piece that, you know, while we were working on this project, we really discovered and I, and I'm new to that area. And so it was really, really fascinating. And I would love to do more research looking at this group of women and how do these messages affect them? And then how does it affect objectifying other women? If they're also attracted to women, but they're also attracted to men, what does that look like? And we're still, we're still working on it. Right. I just think that this project is so interesting. And I think it really highlights a great intersection of your work because really what is so fascinating is that it seems as though attraction to women is in many ways protective. And I think that part of the thing that we were thinking about why that might be is that perhaps it's that when you are a queer woman, you're not just seeing every other woman around you as competition because in typical kind of heterosexual framing women are really pitted against each other just all the time and it's not just for the attention of men it can be for job opportunities for social status for all of these other aspects of our lives because as women we're sort of socialized to think that there can really only ever be one woman in any position. And that can be incredibly damaging when you want to have friendships with other women, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, all the research looking at the career field with women is, says a lot of the same things. And although it's not my research area, I do find that parallels a lot with the, um, with um, some of the sexual objectification things. And in, in terms of the theory that says that women tend to be pitted against each other or for competition um, in, in, in many aspects. And so, yeah, it's just so fascinating that, you know, being attracted to women might be a buffering effect, which is very, very fascinating. Yeah. So I also wanted to talk about another paper of yours because you're preparing a paper about gender role attitudes among adolescents. And you mentioned this earlier about why it's so important to understand how adolescents view gender roles. But just tell me a little bit more about this project and sort of reiterate why it's so important that we understand how adolescents are understanding gender, especially in a more modern context. Right. So, you know, researchers have been looking at adolescents and gender attitudes for many, many decades. And the reason is, is that adolescence is a really formative developmental period for kiddos where they are becoming more independent. Um, they're kind of shifting from spending a lot of time with their parents and family to their peers, teachers, some at, you know, teens work. Um, and so they're really starting to get their sense of who they are, their identity. And a part of their identity is their gender. Um, and so, you know, as, as little kids, you know, they do learn about gender and those are very, you know, formidable years also to learn about gender because they're picking up all the messages, but in adolescence is kind of when they implement them. Um, they start dating and they start relationships. Um, they start sexual relations as well. And so all of those pieces fit together and why do adolescence is important to look at. Um, in terms of the, the paper I'm working on with Dr. Rachel Cook, I, uh, we are kind of looking at how gender attitudes shift through adolescence. So some researchers think that they become more traditional, meaning, you know, a little bit more um, women should be homemakers, men should be breadwinners, 
And although it's modern society, those messages are still very prominent, but they come out in subtle ways. And so it's still important to look at gender role attitudes in adolescents, even though adolescents nowadays are starting to question these things, which is great. There's still that piece that's kind of there um, that we need to kind of chip away at. And so, you know, we we actually found that general attitudes tended to decrease over time, um, which some research had suggested as well. So the, the research in this area is very mixed. Some say they go up, they go down, they're curvilinear, which means they might go up and down and up and down. Um, so this is very, still being worked out even decades after the research has begun in adolescence. And so we found that general attitudes decrease over time, meaning that as adolescents grow and they learn and they, they are around other peers and other ideas and other people, their attitudes are becoming more flexible, right? Their gender attitudes are more flexible. They're willing to compromise that men don't have to be this way, women don't have to be this way. Even if they were raised that way, even if they're raised in a traditional household, they might still, you know, be able to question some of those things and think, okay, like, my friend's parents aren't like that, so why is that? And so that's kind of why it's important to study adolescents and also for intervention and prevention work. Um, a lot of that happens in adolescence as well. Right. And I love what you've said, because I think there's an understanding that, you know, right now there's arguably more malleability around gender roles, probably than ever before. However, there is a push for this kind of desire for traditional gender roles as well, as well as what we can see is a marked increase in anti-woman rhetoric and ideologies like, you know, with this incel movement and hate crimes against women. And that's why I think your work is so important, Diana, because it really represents an important step in understanding, in understanding just how damaging maladaptive views about gender can be. So I'm wondering, kind of looking forward, what are areas or trends that you think should be explored by future gender researchers or better yet by you? Like if you had the ability to just create your dream project where if money and time were sort of no object, what would you be most interested in exploring? Yeah, I mean, there's kind of two different questions embedded in your question. So really researchers, you know, policymakers and intervention, you know, scholars should, should really focus on a lot of things. But one of the things I think is important is healthy masculinity because, you know, which is another area of my research, masculinity. So I, um, it, masculinity is related to these gender attitudes. You know, men who are more masculine tend to also be more traditional and more sexist. So, and adolescents tend to pick up on these messages of, of what it means to be a man and then what it means to be a woman. And so if we promote healthy masculinity that you don't have to be aggressive and violent and objectify women to be a man, that you can be emotional, you can, be vulnerable with your partner and with your friends. You can hug your best guy friend and it's fine. And those things I think are really important to, to start at a young age, the, those ideas. And so some work has been done promoting healthy masculinity, usually in high schools, but you know, I argue that really it should be done sooner because by high school, most, most kiddos have an understanding and kind of those ideas are becoming more solidified. Um, for me, I would like to do that too, but given my research and quantitative re study, you know, research, I really want to kind of understand how men, you know, not only, um, you know, young adult men, but just, you know, men of all ages, how does, you know, masculinity fit into their relationships? And then how does that also affect women? Um, and so, you know, some of the research I've started doing and what I hope to work on in the future is really this idea that, you know, being having a toxic idea of masculinity, that men need to be dominant, powerful, have control, um, be sexually active with many women, um, that that can really damage their own identity, that many men have depression, 
Many men commit suicide. And these are some issues that are very, very important for men. Also, these are very issue, these issues are important for women. That women who are in relationships with these more traditional men tend to not sat be satisfied in their relationships, might not be very happy. And so those are some, that's some work I kind of want to do further, looking at actual couples, which I haven't been able to do yet. So it's called dyadic data, which is looking at couples. Um, and just to kind of see how these gender role attitudes play out, you know, and a big part of this is going to be looking at adults and their transition into marriage and their transition into parenthood, because research shows that these are really important times of people's lives that, you know, many people become more traditional once they have kids, they kind of fall back into those gender roles that they were taught as kiddos. Even if they think that, you know, they're very feminist ideas, they're more egalitarian, which gender flexible, they kind of fall into those roles once kiddos are born. Um, so my research would be a longitudinal research kind of looking at the transitions into these, these different pieces of life, but that would be, that would be the, the best to do. Well, I think that sounds incredible. And I know that you're going to be able to do that at some point in this wonderful career of yours. I think it's so wonderful that you've talked about sort of toxic masculinity and the ways that masculinity can harm men. Because, you know, we spent time at the beginning of this episode talking about the stereotypes and the roles that women are forced into and sort of the ways that that caused you and I both a lot of frustration early in our lives and even up until now. But the thing is, is that men aren't completely immune to that either. Men are forced into these boxes as well that are absolutely suffocating. But I think with men, many of them suffer in silence and aren't presented alternatives because that's part of toxic masculinity, right? Is that if you say that you need help, then that makes you less of a man. And that can be incredibly damaging to mental health. So I would be so curious to see how that that would impact relationships, like you were saying. So I think you have a wonderful sort of research frame. So I just, I love what you do, Diana. And right now you are on the job market. So I think that, you know, putting that energy out there, my hope is that you'll be able to do that research wherever you land. Thank you. Yes, I, I really hope so. Or at least like kind of chipping away at it, getting there slowly. You know, I have to remember that. It's a marathon, not a sprint, <laughs> but, um, but yes, I'm very excited to go, you know, on the job market and to kind of take some of these research ideas and really hone them, you know, in, in, a, in a space where I have the resource and the tools to do it. And to be honest, as a grad student, you, you are limited by a lot of things and you're limited even by people taking you seriously. And so having a title is going to help you know, further some of this research, especially looking at things like masculinity and sexist attitudes, which are still a little bit taboo. Right. Diana, your work is so important. I once again, just want to say thank you so much for coming on and having this conversation. So before we transition into our sort of final deep questions, do you have any final words or anything you'd like the audience to know? We'll leave all of your contact information in the show notes in case anyone wants to reach out to you. Um, yeah, so, okay, so, uh, what do they want, what do I want them to know? Um, that, <laughs> and, you know, with some of this research, it's heavy and it's difficult and it weighs on a lot of people for sure, um, but it's okay. And making some strides is good, even if we take two steps, one step forward and two steps back, like we're still trying to get there um, and it's not gonna happen overnight. And, um, you know, and if anyone has questions about my research, yeah, reach out to me. If you have questions about grad school, reach out to me. Um, my I, whole path in college has been very different. I didn't even think I wanted to get a PhD and here we are. So yeah, absolutely reach out to me if anyone has any questions. Awesome. 
So we're going to transition now into our final questions. And so these are going to be just sort of deeper cuts where I'm going to get a little bit more of your personal philosophy. So are you ready to start? I think so. (laughs) All right, Diana, my first question is, what motivates you? Um, I'm pretty self-motivated, to be honest. Um, But, you know, I've always wanted to help people my whole life. And so I didn't know how to do that. I didn't know which, which path to take to help people. I just knew I wanted to do something good with my life. I wanted to make changes or, you know, do something tangible. Um, And so that's kind of why I got into the field. You know, research is tangible. I can study these things and hopefully these things will help um, in the future. And so that really motivates me to kind of break apart some of these, you know, systemic things that uh, are very, very, very hard to move. And so that, that really motivates me, I think. Well, and you motivate me. So I love the work ethic that you've brought and just watching you work has really been incredible. So. Thank you, Aubrey. My second question is what do you love? Yeah, you know, that's, you get to ask those questions and you kind of have to sit like, I love things. I just don't know, you know, um, honestly, I just like being around people. And again, that kind of stems from me helping people. And so I really just love interacting. I love talking about different topics, things I've never thought about before. You know, my love for learning it's gonna, I love being in this career because I can learn for the rest of my life. And so I really love learning new, new things. Like I love talking to you about, you know, the work that you're doing, which is also amazing and awesome work. And I'm very excited for your future. And, you know, I just, I just love talking about all of these things that I've never thought about challenging yourself, challenging other people, if they're willing, is, is something I, I really love. I love that. That's a beautiful answer. Thank you. My final question is, what is one rule you would want everyone to follow? Hmm. Just, you know, be a good person. Don't be a jerk, I guess would be the the general thing. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I think, you know, a rule to follow is to always question things and don't always take something for granted and don't just take it at face value. Always be questioning, always be asking um, questions that you're not sure of and just be open, just be open and acknowledge prejudice and acknowledge where you're at. Um, and yeah, I would say, yeah, just be a nice open person. (laughs) Well, I think that is a fantastic rule. Diana, once again, thank you so much for coming on. This has been a conversation with Diana Jenkins, and it has been great. So thank you, everyone, and have a good day. If you're interested in contacting today's guest, you can reach Diana at dljenke1 at asu.edu. Connect with us and get access to all of our podcasts by visiting the sanfordschool.asu.edu slash podcast, where you will also find links to all of our social media channels. Thanks for listening.